सेव किया था ना मैं सिर्फ इसलिए गया था क्योंकि उसने मुझे कॉल किया दैट्स इट बट लिसन तो सेव इट फॉर समवन एल्स जिंदगी में सेव करना जरूरी है मगर जब बात पैसों की हो सिर्फ सेविंग से काम नहीं चलेगा एक्विटी म्यूचुअल फंड्स में इन्वेस्ट कीजिए और अपने सेविंग्स को आगे बढ़ने का मौका दीजिए म्यूचुअल फंड इन्वेस्टमेंट्स आर सब्जेक्ट टू मार्केट रिस्क रीड ऑल स्कीम रिलेटेड डॉक्यूमेंट्स केयरफुली महाराष्ट्र पॉलिटिक्स हैज बीन सो ड्रामेटिक सो कंटेंशियस एंड सो क्लटर्ड दैट आई एम श्योर दैट ऑलमोस्ट ऑन एवरी पॉइंट देर इज मोर देन वन ओपिनियन yet i may have a question <coughs> to which today there will be only one answer so here is the question who is the man of the match of whatever is played out in maharashtra so far i am quite sure everybody on all sides of the political uh, dividing lines everybody will say it is sharad pawar so today's cut the clutter let me try do something which i rarely do which is to declutter a public figures life or a public figures political or public personality and i do it for sharad pawar not just because he is a newsmaker because he is probably the most fascinating and multilayered and interesting politician that i have made or i have had the pleasure of knowing for a long time now so who sharad pawar sharad pawar is an original congressman and in some ways a constant congressman yet he has left the congress many times the last time he left the congress in 1999 he hasn't gone back in the past he's left the congress but he's gone back to it now for 20 years he hasn't gone back to congress yet for 20 years in any formulation that matters he's been congress's partners in a coalition wherever he was needed now understand sharad pawar he was pushed to the wall in this case uh, it does seem to me uh, if i know his mind he fought back like this because he he realized that narendra modi and amit shah were going after not just his party and his power but they were also going after his family they were dividing his party and they were dividing his family because remember supriya sule is his daughter she is an mp she is the mp from his party from his home constituency of baramati and ajit pawar is his nephew it's a very close knit family uh yet daughter is daughter nephew is nephew he did not want to dispense with one for the sake of the other and i think even when he and modi met the other day i can only imagine i was was on the fly on the wall but if i was on the fly on the wall maybe i would have heard something like mr modi i haven't been of much harm to you remember i kept your party in power for 6 months in maharashtra in the last assembly until the shiv sena joined remember 2014 uh, bjp had fallen a little short of majority uh, shiv sena had not joined the government so the only way fadnavis's government survived was because ncp was abstaining so maybe and i'm imagining this conversation uh, but i speak from the knowledge of uh, sharad pawar's personality and method so would have been something like look i've been useful to you uh, i mean no harm to you uh, we are friends i am much older than you i know you want maharashtra but don't do it by breaking my party and my family because if you do i will have to fight back obviously uh, if that mythical conversation took place or not or not i don't know but even if it did his advice wasn't taken he was pushed to the wall so he fought back to preserve his party his politics his legacy and also his family and also to keep his nephew and daughter together now he has a grandson in politics as well so he is the big victor right now now why do we find him such a fascinating character first of all take a quick snapshot of his political career 1956 he became a young activist for uh, for the congress party 58 he joined youth congress then he grew within the party from the uh, from the uh, from, uh, from the bottom up he became over time a protege or a favorite of yb chavan he ashwantrao chavan who was the great maratha strong man and became the defense minister of india after krishna menon had to leave in the ignominy of 1962 and in my view yb chavan is the builder of modern indian defense 
machinery uh, because he put together India's armed forces which were in a disarray after the Chinese war. So Sharad Pawar learned from him, grew under him, at the age of 27 contested his first election, very young those days in Baramati for the state assembly in 1967. It was a tough election for Congress party, still he won. He was soon a minister uh, and then he kept on rising until at a very young age he became Home Minister uh, under the other Chavan, Shankar Rao Chavan, and then at the age of 38, he became Chief Minister. Now, that is how in 1978, that is how quick his progression has been. And how did that happen? Now, again, drama has followed him through his life. By 1978, his mentor, that is Y.B. Chavan, had left. Indira Gandhi's Congress and gone to another faction. Remember after the emergency, Congress party broke up into many factions. They had gone into a faction called Congress U. U stands for Earth, Devrajars. That faction contested separately in Maharashtra state elections. Indira Gandhi's Congress contested on its own. Together, they got a bunch of seats. The largest single party, see how familiar this sounds. The largest single party was the Janata Party. Congress U and Indra, Indra Congress had fought against each other. Congress U had broken away from Indra Congress. And yet, to keep the Janata Party out of power, Congress U and Indra Congress combined to set up a government of their own. Uh, the government lasted some time. And then you know what happened? After a while, Sharad Pawar left that formulation and joined up with Janata Party and again became a chief minister. That government was then dismissed by the Congress Party when Congress came to power back at the center in 1980. Those days, anybody coming to power in the center used to use Article 356 and dismiss any state government. They did not like. After that, he again became chief minister in 1988. He was back in Congress. And how did he become chief minister in 1988? Once again, the Congress party, he rejoined the Congress in 1987 under Rajiv Gandhi. In 1988, Congress party fell short by five. It got 141. Sounds familiar again? Because in Maharashtra, half a mark is 145. Congress got 141. So, Sharad Pawar found a dozen independents and he formed a government. So, 1988, he became chief minister again. So he became chief minister in 78 at the age of 38. He became chief minister again at the age of 48 uh, in Maharashtra. Now as head of the Congress party. And then what happened? Then Rajiv Gandhi got assassinated. Uh, there was a choice of the new prime minister. Sharad Pawar thought he had a good chance. So she, he challenged Narsimha Rao for that position and lost. There was no love lost between them. But again, see what happened. Narsimha Rao appointed him defense minister. He performed that task quite dutifully and people forget that he was the defense minister who opened India's armed forces to women. Now, I used to think that maybe it happened because his only child is a woman. But you can imagine in 1991-92, what kind of resistance would this have had 30 years back? What kind of resistance would this have had from a very conservative military brass and also from the politicians? Yet, he was able to do so. Of course, there were many jokes about him. Uh, at one point, he decided that he was going to uh, urbanize or gentrify India's cantonments. And rumors spread that he was going to start with Pune. And there were rumors that, oh, look, this guy knows more about the real estate of Maharashtra than you and I may know about our living rooms. So can you really trust him with containment land? So that reputation and controversy has always followed him. So he was not able to do that. I think that project was dead on arrival. Uh, maybe under another defense minister, something like that would have happened. But see again what happens. He and Narsimha Rao have no love lost between them. 92, December first week. Babri Masjid falls, Bombay has massive riots, uh, Bombay's chief minister, Maharashtra's chief minister then Sudhakar Rao Nayak is not able to handle the situation. So what does Rao do? There were many conspiracy theories that he wanted to get rid of Sharad Pawar from the central government, but he goes to Sharad Pawar and says, listen, Maharashtra is very important, Bombay is very important, can you go back as chief minister? So Sharad Pawar goes to 
Maharashtra as chief minister just while the fires of the riots were still burning. And within days, within a very little while of his getting there, Bombay blasts took place. And then he did something on which he made a sort of confession or a disclosure to me in a 2006 Walk the Talk story based on that uh, interview with him, where he said, and that is something for which uh, his critics on the right, on the Hindu right, attack him wrongly, I think, in my view. He said that he deliberately lied on the day the serial blasts of 1993 took place in Bombay. And why did he lie? He said there were 12 blasts. I was worried that because he knew the details, he knew that uh, this was Muslim terrorists. Uh, and he was afraid that once again, angry Shiv Sainiks will come out. And once again, angry Hindu mobs will come out. And once again, riots will return to Bombay because the earlier fires had barely, barely died by then. So what did he do? He lied. He said there were 13 blasts. And he placed one of the blasts, his mythical blast, in a Muslim, in a, in a deep Muslim locality. And he also hinted broadly that this, this could possibly have been the handiwork of LTTE or some Tamil group like that. Remember, that was the period when uh, LTTE was much in news. They had assassinated Rajiv Gandhi just a couple of years earlier. So he used that subterfuge and he makes, makes, makes no bones about it to protect his city and the state. So that's the colorful uh, character that we are dealing with. Now, who is Sharad Pawar? First of all, uh, there's a line that Pranam Mukherjee once used with me uh, in an interview when I asked him, what is Sharad Pawar saying? That is after the left had broken away from the Congress uh, during UPA 1, uh, he made a statement in Odisha that maybe left can come back. So there were some rumors, as usual conspiracy theories. Uh, Sharad Pawar and conspiracy theories go together. Uh, nothing that he does, even if he goes to have lunch with somebody, there will be a conspiracy theory behind it. That's the kind of personality he is. So there was a conspiracy theory that he's making these statements because he might now defect to Prakash Karat and Mayavati to that formulation to bring down the UPA. So I asked Pranam Mukherjee, why is Sharad Pawar giving these mixed signals? He said, Sharad Pawar always gives mixed signals. So for me, that is the defining statement on Sharad Pawar. But he stayed on with Congress. He did not betray the Congress. In 99, as I mentioned to you, he left the Congress. Why did he leave the Congress? He left the Congress because he, along with Purno Sangma uh, and Tariq Anwar, Congress leaders, all three said that Congress should be headed by a native born Indian, which means not by a foreign born Sonia Gandhi. So they were, there was a bunch of dramatic events. They were expelled or they left, but they left to form the Nationalist Congress Party as to underline the point that they were not, not quite happy with the foreign leader. And yet, whenever an opportunity arose, he shacked up with the Congress Party. He's never gone with the BJP. And I think he said it many times in his life, including to me, that I will go with anybody never with BGP, but he also has used one line, which is the lead motive of his life, which is nobody is untouchable in politics. So his, his doors have always been open. He has, people say, oh, he has so much money. Uh, he's the richest politician in Asia, maybe in the world. You can say all those things about him, but I can tell you, uh, if you raided him, you will not find any of that because his capital lies in his IOUs because he doesn't say no to anybody for a favor enemy, friend, also in his mind, I wrote this about him once, in his mind, he has a Chinese wall. Uh, so personal stays on one side, political stays on the other. And he never lets the two mix. So his personal relationships, networking is on one side. It comes very handy at various points of time. But political is the other. So he will do a favor or seek a favor even to or from his worst, bitterest, Adversary. That's why I can imagine the conversation that he might have had. But as I told you, that is, I'm imagining that conversation. I was not the fly on the wall. So, how do you then defy him? There are people who would say uh, he is secular, patriotic, astute. How does that square with his description as corrupt, richest politician, 
and the most cynical politician. I think all of that in some ways is true. Uh, he, is, he is a very old-fashioned politician with a very thick skin and very strong immune system. He is by no means uh, a paragon of Gandhian virtue. So in fact, his own friend and party colleague D.P. Tripathi, I once asked him about him and he said that, look, he is, he, he said that he once told Buddhadev Bhattacharya, the uh, CPM leader, that Sharad Pawar is the only genuine bourgeois politician in India. And he said that Sharad Pawar asked me, why are you calling me bourgeois? So he said, because you are ho. Uh, and he gave me an example. He said there was an event where Narendra Modi got up and went to Sharad Pawar and said, Are, you don't come and meet old friends anymore. This is after Modi had become Prime Minister. And DP Tripathi said, see, that is the kind of thing that Sonia Gandhi or Rahul will never do. Because they are not dharti se jude hue. So Sharad Pawar, Modi, these are politicians who are dharti se jude hue. Hai. So that's the reason I called him bourgeois. He also said that Sharad Pawar has suffered because of his lifestyle. He's not an austere man. He makes no secret of the fact that uh, he doesn't pretend to be poor. Uh, he lives in a very nice farmhouse in Baramati. I can tell you, He's almost deified in Baramati to the extent that I have seen his portrait along with gods and goddesses in barber shops and tea shops uh, in Baramati. So, and also he's very happy to do favors to people, all kinds of favors. So a reputation has grown that if you need help of any kind, I suspect even financial, go to Sharad Pawar. If nothing, he will get someone to call some banker, ask Vijay Malia. Uh, maybe you will get some more details. So that is the kind of person that Sharad Pawar is. Now, uh, I told you that he was the first defense minister to open the uh, armed forces to women. He also gave women property rights in Maharashtra. He also was the first to give 33% reservation to women in Maharashtra's local bodies. Very complex character. Now, how complex I will tell you. People say, He's going to go with BJP. He's now gone with Shiv Sena. Uh, yet, I, for one, I have many other questions on his career, his life. He's very cynical. Uh, he gets a lot of things wrong. He's not the perfect politician by any means. But he's never been with the BJP. Uh, remember, if you talk of secular commitment, he's an atheist. He's an atheist to the extent that he doesn't even take his oath of office in the name of God, but he does so by solemnly affirming. In fact, when UPA was sworn in, three UPA ministers, besides those of the, uh, those of the DMK, uh, who are political, politically atheists, three other ministers took their oath by solemnly affirming. That was Pichadambaram, A.K. Antony and Sharad Pawar. So to that extent, he is secular but his politics is completely inclusive he will go with anybody and you can see that in the way this game in Maharashtra has now played out because what has he done he saw an existential threat to himself his family his legacy and his party now to fight back the first thing he did was to go and join hands with Shiv Sena. Shiv Sena has been his enemy forever. In fact, the reason, the reason he came back to Congress party after having left it was to say that, look, the menace of Shiv Sena has to be stopped from developing. Balasab Thakre has said all kinds of the nastiest things about him. There was this famous or infamous Vora Committee report, which was rumored to have said that Sharad Pawar is connected to the underworld. That report was never proven. In fact, the publication that published that report later apologized because Sharad Pawar sued them. Also, he is the one who drove the Congress into it. And finally, he is the one who took his nephew uh, under control and brought him back in line instead of someone like Bala Th Saab Thakre who cast away his nephew. Raj Thakre. So, the man of the match is the most fascinating, by no means the cleanest or the quietest and by no means the least controversial character in Indian politics.
And you know, while he he is such an inclusive person who talks to everybody, returns everybody's phone calls, but if you cross his path, uh, he can be quite vengeful. Uh, almost any politician, even in the cricket board, he led BCCI and ICC. So people who crossed his path, ask Lalit Modi, ask Jagmohan Dalmia, those people never recovered from his vengeance. Also, even Gutka, the chewing tobacco, he thought he got cancer, oral cancer because of Gutka. He had Maharashtra government ban Gutka and later he had government of India ban Gutka or chewing tobacco nationally. So if chewing tobacco gave him cancer, he took revenge on it by saving so many lives across the country. And in fact, he once even agree, agreed to do a full walk the talk with me, only talking about Gutka and cancer and the ban on tobacco, smoking, etc, etc. So that's the kind of person he is.